Now, what is this evidence? Why do we believe that Planet Nine exists? The reason is that if you go beyond Neptune and look at the Kuiper Belt that I just mentioned, right, the uh, this field of icy debris, and focus on the most long period orbits within the Kuiper Belt, way, there's way too much focus in the scientific community generally on accolades. I don't think it's actually a healthy driver for um, for scientific progress uh, at all. Uh, uh, there's organic matter in in those plumes, so it's it's not impossible that the solar system has at least primitive life elsewhere other than Earth. We just don't know. Even though he got the orbit and the mass wrong by kind of a factor of two, almost, he was able to get the night sky location of this planet, Neptune, down to excellent precision. Hey, welcome back to our grown community. In this interview, I'm speaking with Dr. Konstantin Batygin, who is very well known within the astrophysics field. He and Michael Brown, the very person who, by the way, disqualified Pluto from being a planet, observed a phenomenon that is likely caused by an undiscovered planet, Planet 9. In this interview, Dr. Batygin discusses the study, where Planet 9 is, and what it might look like, and why it is not primordial black hole or a cluster of moons that some scientists suggest. We also discussed planets in general, science, music, immigration, and many other subjects. One quick warning, due to network issue, we experienced some delays, but not material. Now, subscribe if you haven't yet, and enjoy the valuable content with 3,000 other people. Yeah, you're an astrophysicist, but you're also a musician and a mixed martial artist. You know, I try. Two minuses make a plus, so you know, I try to do <laughs> at least two things. Yeah. So who's going to win, Elon Musk or... Mark Zuckerberg. I think it's just going to, that's just going to depend on, you know, on a large variety of factors. But whatever happens, I really, um, you know, I really anticipate this super nerdy match. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an unusual thing. Like we're living through an unusual uh, period of time when, you know, the most kind of anticipated you know, match is between two nerds. And I, I think that's, uh, you know, that's not going to be the case forever. And so we should enjoy it now. Yeah. And who, who are you betting on? I personally, uh, I'm betting a little bit on Zuckerberg, to be honest, because he's been taking this seriously recently, right? I mean, he's been taking like uh, jujitsu and has been doing it honestly. And I don't know, like, I, I don't know, maybe Elon Musk has been training as well. But I just don't know that he has. So in the absence of data, you know, I go with the data that I have. And I, so, yeah, uh, statistically speaking, you know, but, but we'll see. I mean, this is what's interesting about it, right? This is not like Zuckerberg going against, you know, Lloyd May, right? This is like two, two wild cards, right? So it's the, the unpredictability of it is, is pretty interesting. Yeah, we'll see. But it is kind of, you know, Revenge of the uh, Part <laughs> 6 or whatever. You know. You're a scientist, but obviously you have friends among musicians, you have friends about, uh, among your MMA compatriots or whatever you call them. So occasionally you probably face people who try to ask you about moon landing and uh, flat earth. Do you remember any such encounters and how did they turn out? Of course. Um, yeah. So, you know, like it's, it's oftentimes, you know, the conversation you get to Uber or something or like mm -hmm. at the yeah. bank, you know, like standing in line or, or you know, it's been, uh, there's like evidence that the moon landing was fake. So I, I always, I think it's, it's really important, right. To, to not, to be kind of like, um, to try to understand where people are coming from because i i'm interested in that like psychological question right like what is it about conspiracy theories mm -hmm. uh which particularly it seems like you know conspiracy theories about aliens and conspiracy theories about this like space related things are really sticky right? mm -hmm. and there's something really attractive about them um so you know i, I i'm interested in the question of why that's so interesting. But I try to usually, you know, have a conversation with people, see where they're coming from, and then sort of ask them questions like, okay, so in practice, you know, like, 
how would you go about faking the moon landing, right? And getting all of it right, like practically, right? And that's when you start to have an interesting opportunity. Then it's like, well, like, you think you got It's like, well, okay, but it's not nuts. Look at what CGI looked like in 1970, right? Like, it's like, you know, having that conversation is usually a useful route to go. But the flat earth thing is another interesting thing because the number of people that, de- that believe the earth is flat is going up, not going down, right? It's just like, that's a statistic that's real. Yeah. And, and I want to understand why that is too. And I, I don't have a good theory because, you know, Going on an airplane, like yesterday, I could see that the Earth was round by looking out the window. So you can see, you can have direct evidence, and yet, you know, this this idea has has taken a broader route. Is it fascinating? It is. I'm just curious. Like when on you pl- when you're on the plane, and you see the curvature, yeah. it's because of the windows were designed that way that people believe it's probably round. Maybe that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. might be the case. Uh, so then, yeah, then you you go and you feel like well, I've had this type of. I was like, so so what's the, you know, who is in on this, right? Like, why why would people do that, right? Like, who is gonna uh, benefit, right? You know, yeah. Yeah, so you know that's that's kind of the. Speaking of the alien stuff, like there were like reports of this recent army officer. Oh, I don't remember who he is. Suggesting they might be some alien spacecrafts somewhere hidden. Yeah. What do you make of it? Do you just roll your eyes and sort of like turn the channel, or are you thinking, of, hmm, maybe there is something? It's a good question. I, uh, I, I know nothing more than the average person that also sees, you know, the the news, uh, and so I, um, you know, for me, it's it's again, it's in this category of of rumors that I think are much more sticky than rumors uh, about other things. Like imagine if someone said, okay, we have in our, um, you know, kind of under wraps, a really, really important secret about solid state physics, right? Just like no one's (laughs) going to care, right? Because it's just like uh, subjects that are so dry, uh, you know, don't take, don't take fruit, but, you know something about search for life the the question of does life exist elsewhere is so attractive that it's kind of uh you know my initial assumption is that always the um kind of in the equation of sell the you know show the rumor sell the news right the rumor gets over amplified because it's so interesting mm. um now if you are to ask you know uh, I guess if you know we were to think about it, it's like a different question of like you know does alien life in general exist elsewhere in the universe? To me, it is statistically impossible that they do not, right? Mm. And it might be boring bacterial life that is just like sitting on the surface of a planet, just like it was on the Earth billions of years, right? Where there were no interesting living things; it was just bacterial mats sitting in a you know carbon dioxide atmosphere and you know it was the kind of oxygenation event that happened within you know the comparatively recent earth history that made all life much more interesting right so like to me it seems to get back to what we're talking about it's impossible that life doesn't exist on other planets planets are really common but the sharper question of course is where's the nearest one Right, mm-hmm. like is the nearest life, you know, in the in the subsurface, kind of the if you dig, you know, twenty, thirty centimeters, or maybe ten meters down on the surface of Mars, would you encounter life that way, or um, is it on the in the oceans of Europa, or do you need to travel, you know, halfway across the galaxy to find the first? You know, planet that's teeming life. That's a question to which we have no answer, and so interesting. It's interesting. Like the sound has improved so dramatically when you start talking about it. It's great. 
to, uh, to when I started talking about life on other planets, that's the aliens. They're like, all I right, he's, I think he's <laughs> he's onto something. Let's uh, let's crank let's up. Fix What's it. weird is, yeah, it's improved on my end as well, and I don't know what happened either. But you know, the it must be uh, it must be either aliens or some <laughs> kind of other intervention. If you were to look for life elsewhere and you could go to mm-hmm. one of the planets or and you could just break this rules of uh traveling faster than a uh, speed of light where would you go if i was to go to one place okay so i think the most interesting place is uh the oceans of europa the second satellite of jupiter i don't think we need to break the speed of light to get there uh, we would need some pretty good radiation shielding because Jupiter has a pretty remarkably unfriendly radiation environment and it's uh, close to uh, the planet. But um, I think that either that or, you know, Titan, the, um, the satellite. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Big, uh, big bug came and landed on my on my ear. That must be another another uh, alien. sign of alien life. <laughs> um, that's right. Yeah. So, like Titan, you know, uh, is a pretty interesting target. As is Enceladus, and both Titan and Enceladus were uh, characterized a little bit by the Cassini spacecraft, and, and particularly in the Enceladus plumes, because it has these plumes that come out on the south pole, and it's kind of spraying out. Uh, you know, salty water. Uh, there's organic matter in in those plumes, so it's it's not impossible that the solar system has at least primitive life elsewhere other than Earth. We just don't know. How do we know that there's this organic thing? In the- oh, oh, it was um, so the spacecraft Cassini actually flew through the plumes gotcha. and and made a made a measurement of the composition, which is super cool. And for Titan, Cassini had a uh, had a lander called the Huygens lander, which landed in one of the lakes. Because Titan is the only other body in the solar system that, at least I know of, that has a hydrological cycle. So it's got, you know, clouds and it's got these lakes, which are which um, are not too different. If you just kind of look at the map, they look not too different from how the Great Lakes in the United States, uh, like in terms of size, you know. Uh, they're they're pretty comparable, but they're not made out of water. They're made out of methane. Mm. Is it methane or ethane? Yeah, I think it was methane. I wouldn't know anyway. You could just say anything else. <laughs> I wouldn't yeah, question. it was like uh, yeah, they're mo- made out of things other than water. So you teach uh, planetary science in Caltech. Uh, how do planets form? That question is in part why I get paid. Right. That question is a sophisticated problem that has been kind of answered and re-answered ever since, uh, you know, the time of enlightenment. Right. So our understanding of how the solar system formed, how planets in general form, continues to evolve. Now, the current state of the art suggests that the way, you know, the terrestrial planets, namely Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars form is that in the protoplanetary cloud uh, that was mostly hydrogen and helium um, that that encircled the young sun, right? Rocky material, rocky um, kind of silicate rich uh, material was confined to a ring of about two and a half Earth masses close to where the Earth's orbit is today. And it is from this ring of matter that the first planetesimals, uh, so planetary building blocks, emerged, um, basically collapsing under their own weight from dust becoming big 100-kilometer you know, asteroids, effectively. And then through the kind of mutual collisions of these large bodies, these 100-kilometer scale asteroids, um, the planets then emerged. So that's the um, current short story for the terrestrial planets for the giant planets of the solar system jupiter saturn uranus and neptune the story is a little bit different in the outer solar system um kind of where ice can be in solid form it's 
more favorable actually to build their cores, to nucleate their accretion by capture of dust. And it's a process called pebble accretion. It's a little bit more nuanced, uh, but the basic idea there is that the growth that dominates is not big asteroids colliding together to form bigger asteroids. It's, it's asteroids capturing dust uh, that orbits also around the sun, and then they grow quite quickly that way. Um, so that's a partial explanation also for why the solar system, if you look at its structure, has kind of smaller planets closer to the sun and bigger planets further away. What I'm giving you, of course, is an incomplete story and an incom- kind of an undetailed version of the answer, but that's part of the, uh, that's kind of the, I don't know, the cliff notes, if you will. And, and Earth then formed the same way as terrestrial. That's right. That's right. So we know that the Earth, um, you know, took more than kind of 10 million years to form, right? We know that the moon forming impact, okay, the uh, kind of Mars sized body that impacted the proto Earth that created the moon, that impact uh, happened 30 to 90 million years after the formation of the sun. And this is very important. Because um, the gas, kind of the the big gaseous cloud from uh, which encircled the sun originally, went away in about four million years. So by the time the Earth was done uh, growing, there was no longer a big hydrogen helium uh, environment uh, there to um, to grow in. So because of this, the Earth, you know, atmosphere, right, is so thin and tenuous and we can sort of do astronomy because you can imagine a distinct scenario right where the earth grows really fast grows really massive uh, while a big hydrogen helium cloud is around the sun and then attains this huge thick atmosphere and then you know we would never do astronomy because we wouldn't be able to see through the atmosphere well and then we wouldn't have this discussion which is unfortunate that would be one consequence, perhaps. Yeah, one the, one of the most unfortunate consequences of such a formation scenario is that this conversation wouldn't be <laughs> happening. <laughs> um, so, people obviously saw the stars and planets from whenever we actually start reading um, the history. They'll be looking at the at the sky. H- how did they discover those four planets, original planets, and how would they tell? the difference between stars and planets uh, back in the day when mm-hmm. we didn't have a telescope or anything? Yeah, so the uh, the word planet in ancient Greek signifies a star that moves, right? That's the key uh, designation. If you watch the Jupiter and Venus and, and Mercury and whatever, Mars, um, on the night sky, right, they move in rather predictable arcs across the night sky while the stars that comprise the galaxy right don't they just kind of stay glued on with relative to one another and so it's these wandering stars that were realized to be planets and uh, of course eventually um, we realized that there are eight maybe more uh, of them in the solar system Um, the ancient civilizations namely the ancient greeks and, and romans they knew of six. They knew of Mercury, Venus, obviously. They knew of Earth. Um, they actually knew the Earth was round um, at the time. Um, they, of course, knew Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And that's all you can see with the naked eye. Now, to see Uranus, you require a telescope. And so Uranus was discovered right around the time of the American Revolution by uh, William Herschel, who was a royal astronomer and he was he spent every night looking for comets and and just kind of like whatever he could find on the night sky and so he would you know look in the telescope and just draw what he saw every night and so that's how he discovered uranus and it was a you know simple discovery in that he saw it and thought it was a comet at first and then um realized that it was moving so slowly across the night sky that it had to be really far away and he then figured out the fact that he could see it and it's really far away means it's really really big and therefore it can't just be 
a random comet. It has to be a legitimate planet. You know, that's the whole thing. That's fascinating. And then Neptune was discovered by equation, right? Yes. So Neptune was calculated before it was discovered, indeed, by uh, Robin Le Verrier. Uh, in 1846, he published his calculations of uh, the existence of Neptune. And the amazing thing about that calculation, right, is that he got, even though he got the orbit and the mass wrong by kind of a factor of two, almost, he was able to get the night sky location of this planet Neptune down to excellent precision. And the reason for that is was basically timing. It so happened that in eighteen in the eighteen forties, Uranus and Neptune were close to conjunctions, so they were kind of close to passing one another. So you could, with a pretty high degree of certainty, calculate where the kind of acceleration, uh, the this anomalous pull on Uranian orbit was coming from, but you couldn't with a high degree of accuracy, say what kind of orbit it lived on. Quite a remarkable, you know, historical alignment of facts, which is that, you know, in 18, in the mid 1800s, right, France was absolutely the right place to be doing celestial mechanics. It was absolutely like kind of at the height of classical perturbation theories being developed in Paris. And Le Verrier was a master of those types of calculations and the planets happened to be in conjunction. So it was a lot of luck. What's the, when, when did they actually were able to observe it? Uh, so Le Verrier was done with this calculation in March of 1846. And the discovery came on September 25th, I think of uh, the same year. And there it's also a fascinating story. He sent letters Basically, like he gave a talk in a Parisian observatory saying, you know, here we are, you know, I think there's a planet. And the astronomers kind of nodded along and said, that's, that's great. Uh, but nobody actively looked for it, uh, at least on the French side. And so he sent letters to his friends throughout Europe. It was the, an observatory in Berlin. That wasn't really a research observatory. It was an observatory that mostly kept track of time. Um, so it was like using the night sky to tell time precisely. And it was the uh, director's birthday. So he told the kind of assistant uh, astronomer, you can do whatever you want tonight because I'll be celebrating. And uh, it was Gal, who was the astronomer, and then the uh, Dare, who was kind of the what is a, in a modern equivalent of a graduate student uh, working at the observatory who brought the updated uh, star charts. And they, with the two of them, they started looking for this elusive planet founded in one hour. That's right. Because it was exactly where Neptune said, oh, sorry, Ulaviria said it would be. Right. Fascinating. That's fascinating. And by the way, when you, back in the day, they didn't have that those powerful telescopes. And even today, the way we see it on pictures, all these planets, it's not what you see when you look in the telescope, right? No, no. In a telescope, back then, they could resolve the fact that it was not a point. Okay, so they could resolve the disk mm-hmm. of the planet, but just barely. Like, that's all they could see, is that, well, it's a, you know, it's something that is uh, that is bigger than, you know, a point. That's not true for Pluto. So when they were when Pluto was discovered, it was actually quite a um, fascinating story as well. When Pluto was discovered, people were looking for a seven Earth mass kind of large object. But when they found something and figured out that it must be this large object that we were looking for, uh, they couldn't resolve disk. Right? They could only see a point, meaning it was really small. And so they decided, well, it must be not seven. It must be only one Earth mass. It was a completely arbitrary you know, <laughs> decision because it's actually impossible to measure mass directly unless you have a satellite. And uh, it was like Pluto's mass was kind of going down and down and down in time as people kept revising 
and saying, well, the telescopes are getting better and we keep looking at this thing and we still can't resolve its disk. So it must be even smaller than we thought before. And then in 1978, when Pluto's satellite uh, Chiron was discovered, it was realized, oh man, this thing is 5,000 times, oh, sorry, 500 times less massive than the Earth. It's actually really small. Um, in fact, uh, the surface area of Pluto is almost exactly equal to the surface area of Russia. Like that's the that's the scale. But then, of course, you have to imagine that condensed down to a ball. It's a fascinating story of a failed planethood. What's the story of Pluto no longer being a planet? And how do you connect it to that? Yeah, so this is something that my friend and partner in crime, uh, so to speak, Mike Brown, has had quite a bit to deal with. So when Mike first started his job as an assistant professor at Caltech, now I think in the 90s, he basically decided that he's going to look uh, for large objects in the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt, this field of debris beyond Neptune, had just been discovered and he was started carrying out this large survey to look for big objects. And he found some, right? He found kind of most of the large bodies, most of what we call now dwarf planets, uh, at least the first you know, set of discoveries were from uh, his effort, including Eris. And Eris is more massive than Pluto. So that raised the discussion. Is that a planet? Is that not a planet? Um, you know, should we have a new designation? And in the end, you know, they sort of decided to create a new class of objects called dwarf planets. Um, and there's even a definition uh, that the International Astronomical Union has for what is a planet. It's a bit of a silly definition, to be honest, but uh, whatever is the case, uh, it's kind of making the distinction between planets which you can think of as you know continents you've got a nice beautiful map behind you so you, i can see you know australia and, and <laughs> africa and unfortunately i cannot see japan uh where i grew up but you know japan is clearly not a continent it's an island and we we make a distinction between those two and in a similar sense right we make distinction between planets that are major things in the solar system that gravitationally control the architecture of the solar system and kind of small things that are along for the ride, so to speak. You know, the asteroids, which don't control anything, and the minor planets, which are geologically very interesting, but nevertheless gravitationally not the dominant players. So this take us to the planet nine. Can you explain? I'm ready. Point? <laughs> what, what what's planet nine and how did you come up with the idea that it exists so planet nine first of all is a hypothetical planetary object beyond far beyond the orbit of neptune right it's a planet in the solar system that we have not yet seen directly but i would say in some similitude with neptune we have calculated that there exists evidence um, you know gravitational evidence for its existence now what is this evidence why do we believe that planet nine exists the reason is that if you go beyond neptune and look at the kuiper belt that i just mentioned right the uh this field of icy debris and focus on the most long period orbits within the kuiper belt then they all tend to exhibit an remarkable amount of structure particularly the ones that are not strongly influenced by neptune appear to be clustered together okay it's as if you know an external gravitational pull has come in and sort of confined them all to a to a pattern that is one line of evidence there are others but that's kind of the easiest one to always imagine because you can just imagine elliptic orbits all kind of pointing in the same direction all confined together by a common gravitational pull. And that's why we think Planet Nine exists. So you made the calculation as a professor or as a graduate student? And how how did it connect to yeah. Mike Brown? What's the story behind it? Yeah, so so this was when I was uh, I was already a professor at Caltech and I had come back to Caltech. Now Mike and I have uh, you know kind of had kind of a decade long collaboration uh, almost by then and so 
we were like, okay, well, you know, there are these colleagues of ours, Trujillo and Shepard, who pointed out this interesting, you know, clustering of an orbital parameter called the argument of perihelion. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was, I think, not being taken super seriously at back then. Uh, it was maybe looked at as a statistical fluke. And we thought, okay, let's look into this more carefully, right? Like, what's going on here? So, Mike and I kind of started working on this together and it took us a solid, you know, year and a half to really flesh out both the data side. I mean, Mike is an expert uh, on all things solar system astronomy, right? He's one of the best people in the world who understands how telescopes work, you know, when it comes down to, you know, the kind of ultimately point sources in the night sky. Like, what is, it, what is this all? Uh, how does this all fit together? And on my end, you know, I am not an observer. I am a theorist. So, you know, trying to make sense now of the data and trying to come up with a physical explanation. So we sort of joined forces on this problem. And it was a ton of fun. We continued to have, you know, a ton of fun together, kind of continuing to flesh out the uh, details of the Planet Nine hypothesis. It's evolved quite a bit, you know, over the last now eight years or so, or, or I guess seven years that, that we've been working on this stuff. And so that's that's what keeps it interesting. You know, we're always thinking of new ways to to try and disprove ourselves and try to improve on the calculations from before and all of these things. Can you explain both things? Like, how do you try to improve the calculation? What exactly you're tweaking? And then right. how do you disprove in yourself? So as far as the Im- improvements, uh, what you do is you, uh, and we kind of do this exercise every time we publish a paper, we try to maximally you know, look back at what we've done and try to make fun of it. Right? Like if we were to be cynical and make fun of our own work, how would we do it? And usually the two things you can attack is what are the missing physics, right? Like, Every simulation by construction is imperfect. You cannot account for everything. So, you know, what are the physical effects that we didn't account for? As an example, the first set of models that we had didn't account for the fact that the sun formed in a cluster of other stars and perturbations from these other stars would have shaped some of the structure of the early solar system. And then how would that influence the solar system that we see today in the sense of planet nine right like that is a question that our early models didn't have the capacity to address and so we improved on that in 2021 then uh subsequently right you can ask questions like uh you know what about the initial conditions right like it, the starting point of your simulation how well do you know that these initial conditions are actually the right choice or approximate the right choice. So, so that's the kind of things that we, we try to work on, okay? Or improving resolution or whatever. Now, yeah, so as far as disproving the existence of Planet Nine, that's very easy, okay? The moment you demonstrate with a high confidence that the patterns that we see are not real, right? And mm. Are a consequence of statistical you know, fluke or, you know, whatever, then, then the whole hypothesis falls apart. And it's very, it's very important to remember that any theory, no matter how beautiful, if it doesn't agree with the data, it's just wrong, mm-hmm. right? There's no, there's no kind of getting, getting around it. So, uh, so that's sort of the way that we, that's the outlook, if you will, that we have and have always had. Now, but, People have questioned, you know, the validity of the kind of statistical significance of the patterns that we see, you know, whether things in the night in the outer solar system really exhibit the clustering that uh, they do. And we have done our own uh, calculations of this. And the kind of number that you can work with is 0.4%. So there's sort of a 0.4% chance that all of this stuff is kind of a statistical, you know, fluke, mm-hmm. right? So that's the false alarm probability of the hypothesis. 0.4% that there is no planet or there is no 
anybody at all. Like I, I've read that it might be some bunch of moons there or some primato yeah black hole, whatever. It so is. that's yeah, that's the that's the probability that the whole thing there, there's no evidence for anything. Mm. Okay. Now, as far as the question of could it be a big uh, collection of debris instead of a planet, this is a, a model that Anne Marie Madigan and her group at University of Colorado have been uh, kind of pushing forward. I don't think that's the right model, not be, uh, simply because we, uh, a student of mine and I, in the last year and a half, uh, looked into it very carefully and because um, you know like if others propose a model that claims to explain the same thing right like you have to take it seriously mm -hmm. and so we did and we did uh very high resolution uh calculations of it and uh demonstrated that including the physics of neptune driven scattering which is very much real but was missing from the original calculations if you include that then the the model fails to work so i don't think that that's a viable explanation then there's sort of there are other ideas like well maybe it's not a planet maybe it's a primordial black hole and that's uh it's hard for me to critique or praise that that idea too much just because primordial black holes i mean that have five earth masses that are kind of small in mass are hypothetical objects anyway it's not entirely implausible, but I think that that's kind of going to the next level of uh, speculation. If you will. And just speaking of black holes, like I think mm -hmm. a lot of people saw the definition. It's uh, uh, some mass that got compressed. That it's it's very heavy, but it's kind of small. When we say it's uh, it has five times uh, mass of Earth, like how small would that be? Like a apple? Yeah, it'd be like about this big. Yeah, like 10 centimeters. So basically that that apple is has its own orbit and it creates this yeah. type of Yeah. So it just goes around the sun just like a just like a planet would. Remember black holes as amazing as they are, uh, they're also very simple objects. Mm -hmm. Right? All they can have is mass, charge and spin. Um they're kind of like fundamental particles in that sense. And they are merely objects that obey the same laws of gravity that everything else does. So let me give you the following, you know, example this is a very common physics GRE question, which is <laughs> what would happen to the Earth's orbit if the sun turned into a black hole tomorrow, right? And the answer is nothing. It would just keep orbiting the solar black hole because the gravitational field of the sun and the gravitational field of a black hole are nearly indistinguishable right they both obey the schwarzschild metric in fact if the sun like if you were to remove all the imperfections of the sun right you remove the spin and kind of the convection all this stuff right then it would just have the the same external gravitational field as the solar mass black hole if planet nine Planet Nine exists, mm -hmm. which it does. We know that, right? I, I, I'll take your word for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm convinced. So it's it's there. So how do you how do you uh, imagine it? Is it the gas planet or it's the? Great question. Definitely not necessarily. We simply don't know, and mm -hmm. there is no way to calculate it. That's the one of the frustrating things about it is that the only thing the models that of the type that you know i construct can tell you is the mass and the orbit i can't tell you where it is on the orbit uh because we don't have the neptune to uranus you know mm -hmm. leverrier's miracle uh type coincidence here in fact we haven't seen any of the distant kuiper belt objects complete a single revolution around the sun anyway We've only seen them kind of move just a tiny, tiny fraction of the arc on their orbit. So I can't calculate where it is. That's why it's hard to find. Technically, if you could calculate, you would be able to see it in the telescope. Is it what you're saying? 
maybe. So depending on what you assume its its composition is, if you assume that it is a planet with a big gaseous atmosphere, then probably yes. But if it doesn't have a gaseous atmosphere, then probably no. And, and again, it depends on where it is in its orbit. So there's a chance that it is detectable now, and there's a chance that it is not with the current generation of telescopes. I read somewhere that the orbit of that planet might be so long that it would take 10 to 20,000 years to rotate around the sun. Is it fair? That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so about, you know, 10 to 20,000 year orbital period is the right ballpark. That's also the level kind of, of uncertainty that we have in the models. We can't really tell you if it's 15 or 14,000 years to orbit the sun once. And depending on where on that orbit it currently is, it's easier or harder to actually observe it in the sky. Is it fair or no? Necessarily? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, the shorter the orbital period is, the easier it's going to be to find, not only because it's closer on average, but also because the most distant portion of the orbit also is closer to the sun. And um, with, with respect to distance from the sun, you actually, when you move an object farther and further away, you lose twice. Okay? Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is if you're observing and you're looking for visible light, you want the light, the photons from the sun to come away, then they have to travel all the way to the planet, okay? So their intensity has dropped by one divided by the distance they've traveled squared, right? This is the same thing as just like a light bulb. If you get away from a light bulb, it's the amount of photons hitting your eye goes as one over distance squared. But then those poor photons have to get reflected off of the surface of the planet and then travel back to the Mm -hmm. Earth. But then they get another factor of one over r squared uh, to in their diminishment of intensity. So cumulatively, you have a one over r to the fourth uh, relationship of how bright something is. So taking something out by a factor of two gives you a diminishment in its brightness, which is a factor of two to the fourth power, which I believe is sixteen. Right. So. You know, you can see how, you know, that plays a huge role. What's the uh, Vera Rubin's observatory? So it is an observatory that's currently being built in Chile, mm-hmm. right? They're making good progress on um, on construction. They got delayed a little bit, just like all of us, uh, because something went down in 2020 and 21. There's like some people got... You know, some some bad thing happened. I don't know. I don't really uh, have recollection of those two years, but uh, <laughs> you know, they got delayed, and uh, um, but they're back on track. So they will be, I think, having first light at either the end of twenty four or, or early twenty five, um, or maybe mid twenty five, and so that's going to be a very high efficiency survey, and they're going to be scanning the night sky discovering Kuiper Belt objects, maybe finding Planet Nine, which would be really exciting. Um, we'll see. Besides being a, a full-time scientist and searching for Planet Nine, you're also a musician, right? And uh, your band, The Seventh Season? The Seventh right? Season, that's right. Yeah. yeah. The music that you guys play, it sounds a little bit like a 70s or 80s rock. Is it fair? Uh, yeah, so we... You know, our project has always been to take a modern spin on on classic rock. So, like, I would say there are, there's a number of bands doing that. You know, one of my favorite bands doing that right now is Ghost, right? Uh, I feel like Ghost is a great, you know, kind of retro rock slash metal uh, take. So, so we are in that same vein. And for the first time... In 15 years, this summer, we're putting out a ton of new music. And I'm super excited about it. So on the 30th of June, we're putting out our new album. And we're going to you know, not put it all out at once. We're going to kind of take it um, basically a week at a time. So we're going to put out some kind of a new, either a song or a new music video or whatever, uh, every week starting on the 30th. And we 
and I'm super, super excited about it. We've got, a, you know, two albums worth of stuff and it's been a lot of fun uh, to get back in the studio and record all of it. We've also, you know, post pandemic uh, started playing live again, which has just been, you know, really, really wonderful. What's the origin of, of the group? So the, the band originally started in, uh, in Russia, and it was my dad's band from like the 70s. And then, you know, they kind of called it a day, I don't know, in 1979 or something, or maybe it was 1980. Uh, but what, whatever was the case, you know, when I was 17 or something, or 16 years old, Right, we sort of restarted the band because I had another band, but we sort of we put out a couple albums, but it was clearly not going to go any further than that. And rather than kind of restart a new band, I was like, you know, we should revive this, you know, the project, the, the seventh season with my dad. So for a long time, my dad, uh, you know, and I played in a band, which was really cool. And then 10, 15 years ago, you know, life happened and we, our trajectories diverged a little bit just because, you know, we had to move and, you know, life gets in the way. But I've been able to keep the band going and really restarted it in a serious way again in 2015 and got, you know, some new members and writing new music. And it's just been a really, really fun uh, kind of DIY uh, activity that, we do of course it's time consuming and it takes you know focus and it takes money but mm -hmm. um it's not something that i feasibly think we can stop doing did your dad confront you about the uh, name of the band even though he's no longer with that you keep, keep it no 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 absolutely not no he is uh we we talk about uh we talk about music i don't know every every day maybe every other day so uh you know this is this is still the same the same band uh, you know he uh, doesn't live in la so it's hard to have him be involved on a daily basis but um but yeah he's uh, totally you know <laughs> there's no there's no internal conflict do you remember your first gig i do um you know the first gig ever was with my band called no relief and it was at an eighth grade you know, talent show. And uh, it's just like enormous, enormous success. And <laughs> enormous, like solidified our, our status as one of the most, one of the biggest bands in our middle school. <laughs> okay. I thought you were going to say uh, in history. I was like, okay, I, that's why I know you. Yeah. No, no. Just like, and yeah. as, <laughs> what was the most like memorable one outside of, as a part of the uh, seventh season where you actually almost lost your mind uh, on, the, on, the, on the stage well that happens every time uh i think uh, i lose my mind every time okay you know there have been a few really interesting uh shows i'll say this one of the craziest things one of the most unusual things that i just like you know makes me more and more convinced that we're living in uh in a simulation right is uh the fact that during the pandemic uh, I got to collaborate with the Miami Symphony and mm -hmm. record a Planet Nine, yep. like symphonic, you know, crazy 20 minute piece. And then we beamed it to the International Space Station and had the astronauts like listen to it. And we used uh, a very sophisticated technology known as Microsoft Teams. Right to connect to the space station, which was another another kind of like level of absurdity where we we just like called them anyway. Uh, so I would say that was that was a really really special. Um, that was a really special experience, right? Just like did not I did not think that that was going to be something within the realm of possibility. I hadn't dreamt of um, something like that, and uh, and it was really really cool. And uh, as far as live gigs, you know, we played a few shows this spring and they were just, they were just a ton of fun. You know, I mean, it's the, when we play live, it's the only time that I feel like laws of physics can be violated and <laughs> there's faster than speed of light communication between the band, you know, us kind of 
I don't know, being fused together into a single entity and also, you know, the audience kind of the feeding off the energy of, of the audience. And, and you can um, see the planet nine. Yeah, that's right. You can see the planet nine. You drink some beers afterwards and everybody can see planet nine. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really special. You know, after the gig, I don't quite remember. I think this was back in February. Um, you know, one guy came up to us and said, man, tonight I felt like everything 2020 onward hadn't happened. Mm. Right. Like I just like, yeah. You know, and, and I feel like that's a really special compliment to, to receive so it's always a ton of fun we have a great time and uh and i think the audience some of the audience also enjoys it some of them yeah <laughs> like how you specified it oh uh, <laughs> yeah so it seems like the uh, music is a big part of your life so if you had a choice to go to the party full of musicians local musicians and party full of scientists which one you would go to uh exclusively a party where People are both. <laughs> it's like that it's known, right? How many of them? Like you, Brian May, who else? Like uh, okay, a Kian guy? Like this is the party of three oh, you're going to be, right? No, no. It's going to be a really big party because, uh, you know, even among the students at Caltech, mm. um, there are incredible musicians. Um, I, I don't know. There's something about the, the connection between uh, how the part of your brain that that is responsible for you know playing music making music and the part of your brain for uh, that's responsible for uh, doing math uh, those are linked yeah the the number of people that that do both is quite is quite large so i um let's see you know in our band right like three um like right now the band is five people and four out of five have phds in oh. Is it like something a astrophysics <laughs> it's not a requirement because one of the guys doesn't and so and it's totally fine we're we're totally you know we're totally cool uh so uh, yeah i it's a more common thing than i think you know is often um it's often assumed like i think the the vision of sort of like the nerdy scientist in a lab coat and I know it looks a little bit like I'm wearing a lab coat, but it's sort of, I promise this is a regular shirt. Uh, you know, it, it's like that notion, I think, was maybe true, I don't know, 100 years ago. Um, a lot of scientists I've, I've met are actually kind of normal. Well, I wouldn't say go as far as to say kind of normal, normal, but they're, they're interesting. Yeah. yeah, normal was an <laughs> interesting choice of words. Yeah. I saw in one of your interviews where uh, you were asked, whether you would prefer to to win Grammy or Nobel Prize, and you chose Emmy. Oh, not Emmy. Gr- Grammy. Does Mike Brown know? Yeah, about Mike Brown. I don't know. I, I've never talked about talked to him about it. I mean, so one of the things that we never talk about with Mike or or with anybody else for that matter are like our prizes. There's way too much focus in the scientific community generally on accolades i don't think it's actually a healthy driver for um for scientific progress uh at all um, and one of the greatest things about doing what i do is that i'll you know almost certainly never win the the nobel prize or anything like that because it is just i'm not in in that field conversely you know i have colleagues in physics who are or in, and in chemistry who are a little bit more obsessed with winning the Nobel Prize. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's a thing that kind of uh, poisons your your outlook a little bit. That's not why one should be on the scientific journey. We should be on the scientific journey just because it's interesting and it's cool and it's curated. Do you think it has a lot to do with uh, the fact that you focus on uh, astrophysics and they on chemistry? And here's the angle. I interviewed the author of history last time and we talked about Alexander the Great. And I, when I was preparing, I was looking at Alexander, what Alexander has done. And it's just all fascinating, amazing. Obviously, everybody knows him and his values. He wanted to have this glory, etc. Then when you switch to astrophysics and r- learning about planets and you kind of realize how immaterial and trivial all what Alexander was trying to achieve is relative to the universe and in general. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I don't want to say it say it's it's immaterial. I mean, I think you know it's really important to also give credit to applied sciences as having a much higher chance of influencing you know our our human experience for the better, right? Mm-hmm. Like whether there is or there is not a planet nine, ultimately, is like nobody's life is going to change dramatically uh, because mm-hmm. of that. But, you know, I think it's it's really a matter of personal preference, right? In some fields, having that, that drive, you know, it helps people. I'm just saying that for me, like, I really enjoy not thinking about that at all and merely doing what I do for the fun of doing it and then seeing what seeing what happens, you know, and then just kind of trying to be maximally honest about my work and uh, just kind of follow my curiosity. So if tomorrow the Planet Nine disproved, you just go about your life as nothing happened? Mm-hmm. I mean, it'll definitely be a bummer. I'll be sad about it for like a couple of hours and then I'll move <laughs> on to trying new stuff, you know? Yeah. 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 Uh, no, I mean, I like, I mean, in all seriousness, right? I am of the view that one should not, should never wait. That is in, a, in astrophysics, one should never wait until you have five sigma of certainty to pursue something, right? This view of like, we have to be absolutely certain that the data, like, no, let, if there is something in, sometimes there, there one is enough, you know, or, or two sigma is enough to say, okay, this is curious. Let's see where it goes. And you develop something. And, you know, in the case of Planet Nine, we, we went with that. And there are, as it turns out, other lines of evidence, right, beyond just the clustering of the orbits that kind of put the whole thing um, together, right? And so it's that confluence of different lines of evidence that makes the story compelling, right? It's not the fact that one thing, one alignment of orbits is very statistically significant. If that whole thing falls apart, like I said, it'll be a bummer, but it's also not the only thing I'm working on, right? I'm always working on a bunch of stuff. My recent... My most recent paper was accepted for publication, I don't know, like two weeks ago or something. And it has nothing to do with Planet Nine. It has to do with magnetohydrodynamic interactions of protoplanetary disks and stellar magnetic fields. And the paper before that was entirely on uh, planet-planet resonances. It was like kind of the uh, gravitational dynamics. And the paper before that was on formation, uh, uh, planet formation. So... I'm not a planet nine like uh, high priest, so to speak, where I, you know it's it's a religion to me. It's like it's one of the most interesting things I work on, but certainly not the only one. You mentioned earlier you know, that you grew up in Japan, so you immigrated to Japan, and later you immigrated to the United States again. How do you compare the process of adaptation to Japan, Japanese culture, and to American culture? How they're different? How they similar? They're very different, um, especially coming from Russia originally. Mm-hmm. I would say uh, in Japan, I was quite shocked initially with the amount of order uh, that Japanese mm-hmm. society has. Right, and especially like coming from Russia in '94, which you know where you could be stunned by the amount of chaos that mm-hmm. you know uh, you could see and experience. Um, so, so that was really interesting. And I think it was really good for me because I'm naturally a disorganized person. <laughs> and I, I think I, it, it helped me focus uh, quite a bit. It was also the place where I started doing martial arts, you know, for the first time. And so that's stuck with me for my entire life. Right. And so like I really appreciate that. And I, I've adopted a lot of a lot of aspects of Japanese culture, which I found find beautiful to just my, you know, daily life. But um really coming to the US, I mean, I remember my parents telling me, you know, like all this time I thought there was something a little bit, you know, maybe unusual, um kind of you know, about you. But turns out there's this place called <laughs> California where there are a lot of other people that are kind of weird in the same way that you are. <laughs> and so uh yeah, I've I absolutely adored moving to California because 
it's a place where I first pursued music seriously, right? You first, you could pr- do it, right? We're just getting together in my friend's garage and uh, just making noise. One thing I really appreciate about, you know, living in California and living in LA, right, is the the fact that it's sort of chaotic mm-hmm. in its own way, but it's also very fractal where you could zoom in to different parts of the American experience and find genuine, I think, authenticity, you know, and, and kind of the more you zoom in, the more interesting it gets. So it's been uh, I, I know this is a very long and winding answer to a simple question, but uh, in the end, I think I've I've really benefited and I really appreciate all of the the kind of the privilege of of having these varied experiences in my life. Not just you know growing up in one place, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that for me, it was really useful to kind of see the experience the three different cultures and all be kind of before the age of 20. How do you think your life would be different if you stayed in Russia or if you lived in Japan? Would you be still doing the science, still uh, astrophysics or something else? Uh, that's hard to say. I mean, I, I really don't know. I mean, one of the things that I can confidently say about life is that there is no, the, the kind of horizon of predictability is much shorter mm. than it seems. Right. Like if I was to take myself from 10 years ago and ask myself, what would I, can I envision myself now? The answer is absolutely not. I would have envisioned, I think something maybe somewhat related, but, but very, very different. So yeah, I think there's no way to confidently answer that question. Yeah. It's ultimately a question of uh, nature versus nurture. And I just don't know what the balance is. In your interview with Lex Friedman, there is one uh, funny moment where Lex switches to Russian for for, for a short mm-hmm. period of time. And Lex sounded just as I expected him to because he, he moved to the US when he was young and he has a little bit of accent. Yet when you start speaking, you don't have much of an accent and you speak a fairly sophisticated Russian. How are you able to preserve the language while living you know, in so many different countries? Is it in the family that you guys typically speak in, in Russian, the, the story? First of all, I very much appreciate you saying that. Um, yeah, I mean, my wife, is, my wife is Russian. We met here in the U.S., but uh, we speak Russian at home. Uh, I mean, depending on the topic. And so uh, maybe that's the answer, but but really, uh, no, I don't have a good. Um, Just happen to be the way, if gotcha. you will. My wife asked a question because she was uh, we were watching the, some of your interviews together. She asked uh, to say, "Hey, um, ask him how his parents were able to raise scientist uh, rocker." It sounds like a bunch of scientists tend to be a musician, so maybe you answer that by. Really? You know, one of the things I really appreciated about my parents growing up is that they never pushed me to be any particular way, right? They weren't like, you have to be a scientist or you have to be a rocker or, or you have to be, uh, you know, or, or anything, right? Um, they were very keen on saying, look, pursue the thing that may, that you're passionate about and do it with you know, uh, like dedicate 120% of yourself to that thing that makes you most passionate. And it doesn't matter what that is, whatever it is, right? Just do it. Uh, they were also, of course, very keen on ensuring that, you know, I've got an education and said, like, mm-hmm. would do the best you can and, and go uh, from there. And so I've always appreciated that freedom of knowing that they have, uh, you know, they support me and they, you know, ultimately, you know, really, really love me. But at the same time, they're not trying to mold me into into some vision of what they think I should be. They wanted me to mold myself into some vision of what I wanted to be. So I don't know if that's a partial answer to your question, but uh, I really lucked out with parents, I have to say, because, you know, it's it doesn't always happen this way, but my both you know my dad and my mom are are really cool and uh you know they both have great senses of humor and so yeah it's been good 
Yeah, speaking of humor, you have this dry sense of humor. And when I was listening to lectures, I saw that people, a lot of times it kind of goes over people's head. And as we were talking today, I'm like, I, you said something and only later I realized it was a joke. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I got that part. So I, I guess you... I'm, it, I'm very serious. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> everything I said. Yeah, I said... There, there was no jokes. jokes today. Yeah, I figured that out. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. yeah. Well, uh, Professor, thank you very much for your time. Uh, best of luck to you with, with your studies. I know Planet Nine is is there, and I'm looking forward to see it. The pictures of it, which you take in person, flying there, and sent back to the Earth. I mean, I'll give it a shot. 